Let's turn in our Bibles tonight to the Old Testament book of Joshua. It explains itself in the first verse. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. So he speaks in verse 1 of uh, his minister uh, being uh, the death of uh, Moses, uh, his the servant. And uh, Joshua was Moses' personal servant, really. Uh, I like what uh, Jesus said in Mark 10, 44. He said, whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. So we're called to serve. We're promoted to servanthood, actually, uh, to serve all. And uh, if we're faithful in a little, the Bible says he'll give us more. In Matthew 25, 21, said, the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been grateful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So uh, in today's world, oftentimes minister is interpreted as pastor. Uh, and, uh, and you know, as the pastor, often in the pulpit teaching, so it's kind of a high profile. People know who you are. And But the, the thing, what supports the church, what holds the church up is a lot of the stuff that gets done behind the scenes that nobody sees in a lot of cases, but it's just as vital because I need my arms propped up through intercessory prayer, for example. Many are praying, praying for me. A lot of helps behind the scenes as the place gets cleaned, we know. Um, there are... There are many across the United States and the world, really, in ministry who are, have to work full-time jobs to support themselves while they're working in a ministry. I've known many pastors that have done that. And here he's talking of Joshua, uh, also named Oshia, which is salvation. Uh, in Numbers, oh, I didn't print up those notes for tonight. Uh, Numbers 13, 16, I'll read it to you. Uh, these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. So this is Joshua. Uh, Moses called him Joshua, or Jehoshua, Jehovah is salvation. Uh, and Moses didn't go into the promised land. He got left behind. And uh, the Jews were in the, why did, why has that happened? Why did, why did Moses not go into the promised land? Well, at the time when the Jews were in the desert, the Jews were murmuring that they had no water and they were murmuring about a lot of things they missed out of Egypt. And God, God told Moses, speak to the rock and, mo- and water would come out. And in Numbers 20, verse 11, says Moses 20, in chapter 20, verse 11, Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. But he said, Speak. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation in the land which I have given them. Sounds harsh, but... The Lord said, just speak to it, and the water will come out of the rock. And Moses must have said, well, I need to help him a little bit. So he jammed his staff in there. Um, And, uh, you you know, when you think about the promised land, we're we're in the United States, but our promised land is really in glory. It's in eternal glory with God. But Moses, if you think about it, Moses represented the law. And you, the law can't go into the promised land. You can't use the law to get you into the promised land, to get into heaven, because we can't, we can't uh, uh, keep the whole law. But jo- Joshua, Joshua represents Jehovah's salvation, the salvation of heaven, uh, salvation of Jehovah bringing us into heaven, our promised land. In verse 2, uh, verse two and 3, every, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land which I do give to them, even the children of Israel. And every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given to you, as I said unto Moses. So uh, here's, here's uh, God's promise to Joshua. He says, you can, you can just step. Just step in and lay claim to it all. Just claim it, because it's already yours. Because I've given it to you. And certainly God has given to us who are believers in Christ a, a victory, a full victory, and a life of victory. 
but we need to step in and we need to take it. A lot of people sit back. I like uh, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, 70. Thanks says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over what? Sin, death, and the devil. He, he, that's a victory. And in 1 John 5, 4, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. So, verse 4, he says, From the wilderness, in this Lebanon, even under the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and of the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. So it didn't go all the way to the, he didn't go all the way to the Euphrates. So he didn't take all that God had given him. And I think that's not unlike us as believers not to take what God has already given us, being hesitant sometimes to step forward, sometimes being content with where we are and not really wanting to move or do anything more. And actually comfort can be a trap, really, when God wants to do more with us. In verse 5, uh, God encourages Joshua here, at 5 through 8. Therefore shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail, fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and, and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper whithersoever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then you shall make your way <clears throat> prosperous, and then you shall have good success. So here's an example of those following the Lord. He says here, they have well, the encouragement of God. Uh, they, they have the commission from God. I, I, he says, I send you into battle. And he says, uh, they're already victors. He says, I give you the land in verse 3. And we can have confidence that he's with us because in verse 5 he says, I will be with you. I mean, if God's for us, who can be against us? I mean, how much more do we need? But God says in verse 8 that you have the law in your mouth always. If, it's kind of one of those if-then statements. If you will meditate day and night, then you will be prosperous. Then you will be successful. Now, I don't know if, uh, if turn to Psalm 1. And uh, let's see, Psalm oh. Psalm 1, great psalm, talking about walking in God's word. Blessed is the man, the woman, that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they're like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Walking by the word of God. Colossians 3, is, I've often, we're going, finishing up Ephesians this Sunday, but Colossians, a lot of similar stuff in it. Colossians 3, 16 and 17 says, Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In whatsoever you do indeed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So it's all about pouring our hearts out to him, and it's his heart that he's put in us to pour out. Uh, verse 9, Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Why fear when God is with us? He says in Hebrews 13:5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, at the end of chapter 28 in Matthew, verse 30 says, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. 
But he said, you can say always, meaning all times, I'll never leave you. But what about in all ways? Two words, in every circumstances. So I'll always be with you in every circumstance. And then he ends it with, amen. That settles it. You can believe it truly. It's a for sure thing. Amen settles it all. So let's see here. Verse 10 through 13. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare your victuals. And we call them victuals, right? Victuals. For within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess it. And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to half the tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God has given you rest and has given you this land. And the Lord does give us rest, but that rest comes only from Christ alone. Uh, John 14, 27 says, Peace I, li uh, I, leave, uh, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So there's again, don't have that spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Verse 14. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them, until the Lord have given your brethren rest as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then you shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, for Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side Jordan toward the sun rising. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commanded us, we will do. And whithersoever thou hast, hast sentest us, we will go. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. An encouragement to Joshua. Or whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death, only be strong and of good courage. So that that's harsh. If you don't obey, you're dead. And uh, entering into Canaan here, like uh, Christians entering a, 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 into a life of victory that God gives us through Jesus Christ, as we conquer those giants of the flesh that rise up in each of us, those sins that do so easily beset us. So Joshua led them in, but he alone couldn't bring them to that special place of rest with the Lord. The Lord had to do that work in their hearts. That was yet to be done. And all, as all believers will be brought to a place of rest also with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he gives us that rest. Uh, Joshua chapter 2. My goal is to do three chapters, maybe a few verses more. We'll see. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men out to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rehab, Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, and I wist not or I knew not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, they closed the gate every night, when it was dark, that the men went out, where the men went I know not, and pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. And she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. Now, Jericho is one of the oldest cities in the world. And this is the first city they came to after crossing the Jordan. And there's flax on the roof. It's interesting, the flax is what they use to make linen. And linen is what they use for the curtains of the tabernacle that we studied in Exodus. But consider they're, they're hiding these agents of Israel. 
they're kind of like super uh, what, uh, secret service people. They're espionage. They're spies, really, aren't they? They're Israel sp- spies. And today we still have all that. Now, imagine the the cost to government, the number of people involved in spying and, and looking at other nations. And we think of the reason for that need. Why do we need to do that? Why do we need to spy on other nations? Why do we need uh, spies and espionage going on? Because of human deception. We deceive one another. We say things we don't mean. We make alliances that we don't intend to hold up, to uphold. It's sin, in other words. And even we as sinners, we kind of have a secret service going on inside of our hearts, hiding when we're in sin. It's our tendency and even trying to hide from God sometimes when he certainly knows all. Verse 8, And before they were laid down, she came up upon the roof. She came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. Rahab. Consider her. She's a harlot. She's a sinner. She's immoral. She's under condemnation from God. Her city's condemned by God. Picture of the condemned world today. Some aware of their impending doom. Now, she wasn't, but she did realize the power of the Israelites. Many people are not aware where they stand with God and don't realize they might be in a grace period. Now, at this point in time, it's been 40 years plus since the Red Sea crossing. And the Jews have, have, have gained some kind of a reputation. There's a few million of them, remember. And... Uh, there were many that were wondering, well, how many are there? And where are they headed anyway? What are they up to? What are they doing? Where will they live? Where, what will they eat if they get to us? Are they going to want our land? Are they going to want our city? I mean, they could take us over. Look, think of the size of them. They're like ants coming right across. But as far as Rahab was concerned, she had heard stories about the Jews. She realized what God was doing with the Jews. She believed it. Many people hear maybe a Bible teaching or a Bible study or read the Bible and they might hear or see the word of God and God's works and hear about God's works and not believe it. There are many people that believe a lot of lies about life and death, thinking that we have lots of opportunities to do this life over and over again because we have reincarnation, lots of lives. And the Bible says it's appointed once for man and then the judgment. Some people think, well, don't worry, the lights will go out, so you'll just end all your suffering. Maybe, maybe not. And then there are those that say, well, everyone goes to heaven. The Bible teaches that it's only through faith in Christ. But Rahab, she's, in a sense, she believes in the Jews. She's heard what the Jewish God has done. She believes the Jewish God is powerful. Is she working out her faith through her works now? She is risking her life for God's people. She doesn't have an allegiance to the people of Jericho, apparently. She's showing that she has faith in God that he's going to do through these Jews what he says he'll do, or even what they have seen in history already. So she is identifying more with the Jews than the heathen people that live around her. And what does she do? She shared the good news with her family so that they would come into the house when they got raided and they would all be saved. And that should actually be all of our first desire when we first get saved. I know when I got saved and realized, wow, what a piece of information I got to share. And some of my family wanted to hear it, some didn't. Because we know that when we go to our family and our loved ones, the message we have may or may not be well received. Verse 18, or I'm sorry, 14 through 18, to the end of the chapter. And the men answered her, Our life is yours, 
If you utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest your pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may you go their, your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless on this thine oath, which you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which you did let us down by. And you shall bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. So he's got this scarlet thread. He's given it to them. Put this in the window. We'll know it's your house. We, we can look at it now and say, well, it, it, we could say that represents the blood of Christ. Only those in the house with the scarlet cord got saved from the army. Only those under the blood of Christ in today's world get saved from the wrath of God. Verse 19. <clears throat> and it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street... His blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. <clears throat> and if you utter this, our business, then we will be quit of thine oath which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. And they went and came unto the mountains and abode there three days until the pursuers were returned. And the pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but found them not. So the two men returned and descended from the mountain and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, <coughs> pardon me, and told him all things that befell them. And they said unto Joshua, Truly, the Lord has delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. So here we have Rahab spared of judgment from the army here because of her trust and faith in what God's going to do through these Jewish people. Now she's under the blood, in a sense. She's under that red piece of thread. It's interesting that the the genealogy of Jesus Christ lists women who are from heathen tribes. Ruth, the Moabitess. Bathsheba, the wife of, wife of David, uh, after uh, David killed her husband Uriah so that he could have Bathsheba. And here's Rahab, a harlot. Jesus came to identify himself with sinful mankind. He has some of those sinful mankind in his lineage. After all, all sin and come short of the glory of God. But he has people like you and I in his lineage. He has conf common sinful people in the line of his birth. In chapter 3, Joshua rose early in the morning. And they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, or, or through the people. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests of the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure, Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So Joshua rises in, in early in the morning to seek the Lord, to prepare for the day, to look at the situation uh, he's up against. And we should be doing the same, consulting the Lord and his word first thing every morning. Sometimes the Lord shows us what to follow, what to go after. Sometimes he just says, go. <laughs> he told Abraham, go, I'll show you where to go. It took three days for the rivers to swell with the spring rains. And uh, there would come a time that they would, uh, as they approached the Jordan, certainly would feel a helplessness there. How do we get across? 
After all, we have millions of people and their possessions as we were at the Jordan. And the ark is moving with them far enough back that everybody can see, hopefully see it clearly. And he says to sanctify. Because the Lord will do wonders with people that sanctify themselves, set themselves aside for God's work. Set yourself aside from those common things. Come into the Lord's presence. Focus on the Lord. If you really want to be used mightily, set yourself apart to him from the world. In Joshua, verse 6, Joshua spoke to the priests saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. So the Lord said in chapter uh, 1, verse 2, he says, just arise and go. Keep the law. I'm with you as I was with Moses. I'm with you. And then verse 8 here, he says, And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When you come to the brink of the water of Jordan, you shall stand still in Jordan. Stand still. Psalm 46 10 says, be still and know that I am God. In Exodus 14, the Lord, uh, God had told Moses to tell the people, stand still. And then he parted the Red Sea so they could cross. So now he says, stand still at Jordan in verse 8. And he'll part the Jordan so they'll cross. You know, you think about it. Moses did the Red Sea. Now Joshua and the priests are going to do the Jordan. And Interesting, just some of the analogies you can get from this is the the Red Sea crossing could represent uh, a separation from the old life, from Egypt, if you will. Egypt often represents the old life. It certainly did for the Jews. Separation from that old life or that life in the world into a life with Christ, which we have now. And the Jordan crossing represents an entrance by faith into Christ's promises. So... It took faith to stand in the Jordan and to expect it to stop. Verse 9, And and, uh, Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. I think the Lord says that to us every day. Come here and listen to my words. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive you out from before you, uh, without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. So he's guaranteeing a victory here over all the enemies. Then and now, Psalm 91, I'm going to read 9 through 11. He says, because you have made the Lord my refuge, Or because you, Lord, are my refuge, is probably an easier way to say it, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Now verse 12. Now therefore, take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, one out of every tribe a man. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks at all the times of harvest. So this is a normal time for high water. It's a high water time for the Jordan River. Spring rains would would overflow it. As you know, we have enough creeks around here in the Genesee River to to see when the rains fall, all the creeks are rising, and it was like that there, overflowing its banks even. And uh, they're approaching it now with the Ark of the Covenant. And it didn't stop, didn't stop until they stepped. Didn't stop before they stepped, it stopped when they stepped. And here we have an impossible situation because God's telling them to walk through the Jordan in the spring rains, the spring flood time. 
And uh, here we have a, either a problem or an opportunity for God to work. And I can imagine them thinking, wait a minute, we've been to the Red Sea, and at the Red Sea, God parted the Red Sea, and we walked through. Is this any problem for God to part these waters here in the Jordan River? No. Verse 16, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam, and that is beside Zeratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. It's the Lord's river, remember. It was the Lord's Red Sea. This is the Lord's river, the Jordan River. He can do what he wants with it. He can create a special water flow. He can create miracles. He's created everything. He could have dried up the Jordan totally. He just could have just went, stop. He does dry up a lot of the problems that we have around us, certainly. And interestingly, the ark is referred to 10 different times. And it symbolizes God's presence as it went before the people to lead them. And it was kept in the river till. All the people had passed through, all of them. The great picture of Christ, because he goes before his people and opens the way, and he stands there at the right hand of God, or he sits at the right hand of God, I should say, till we cross over, and he protects us. And we have to be ready and prepared for his leading, and we must look to Jesus, our Joshua, because he's always leading us. But sometimes we have to get our feet wet by faith. We have to get into it, and God will use us. I like what uh, C.S. Lewis says. It's a quote by him. He said, God will sometimes command us to do slowly and blunderingly what he could do perfectly and in the twinkling of an eye. In other words, God doesn't need us, but he'll draw us into something sometimes, and he will use us uh, to his glory. Uh, Something else that's significant here. 1,400 years later, this is actually a place called Bethbara. It's where Jesus was baptized. I've been to that spot. This particular spot of the river is pretty wide, actually. There are times where the river, the Jordan, looks like you could probably leap across it, kind of like uh, around a quite creek. But this is really a, uh, a place where Jesus was baptized, interestingly. And uh, I think uh, this would be a good place to break right now. And... Uh, have a time of prayer. So, Lord, we do thank you uh, for what you've done, Lord, and uh, that you have prepared a way for us, Lord, that you sanctify us, that you purify us, that you lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit. We don't have to be wondering if you've told us to do something. We may not know, Lord, but you haven't told us that we need to know. We need to obey and trust. So thank you for that, Lord, and uh, Be with us now, Lord, as we have a time of fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen.